We have Neil Walgren on the call. Neil has got a specialization in industrial real estate. So we're going to really dive into that here today. If you want more information or follow along, head over to MAG Capital Partners. Their website is magcp.com. Um, there's a lot of great resources and information there. So I really appreciate your time, Neil. Thanks for having me on, JD. Well, this is something that's going to, let's start things off. Um, this is going to surprise a lot of people because I know that you have a considerable military background and from going from that to real estate investing had to have been a journey. How did you get there? Yeah. And so, you know, out of high school, I ended up going to the Air Force Academy and then went on to the Air Force to fly uh, the C-130 Hercules, so kind of a, a tactical airlift, kind of smaller cargo plane and did that for I guess almost about 10 years between the Air Force full time and then a, a couple of years at the Navy Reserve afterwards. And kind of hit a, a natural transition point where I knew, you know, it was, it was time to look elsewhere outside of the military. And most, most other pilots, uh, you know, the natural flow is to typically go into the commercial airlines. And I thought about it. And I just, I couldn't get excited about it. You know, you, you get, you, you need a certain amount of fire behind, you know, what you're doing, or at least not hate it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if, if you don't have that fire from day one, you know, it, it never stays quite as strong or it's hard to, but if you don't necessarily have that from day one, it's probably not the right track for you. And, you know, that was kind of my, you know, I would say a defining moment on, Hey, you know, I think I should find something that really aligns with my values a little bit better. And kind of in that period, I had a friend recommend rich dad, poor dad to me. And so I read that and really, you know, kind of got excited about the idea of, you know, really building equity through, you know, your work, through investments uh, in a way that you can have other sources of income working for you that's not directly tied to your labor individually. And that was, you know, I think the driving force behind, you know, leaving the aviation world and ultimately what led me into real estate. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if you were ever deployed or anything, but it's always interesting. I, I run into quite a few uh, former military people or, or those that are even serving today. And, and it seems like, you know, there, there's a common story there is that they read rich dad, poor dad, <laughs> while they had some downtime somewhere. And uh, when they got back, it was the first thing they tackled. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I did deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And at least in the air crew world, which I can speak of, you know, there's there's a lot of moments of, you know, a lot going on. It's exciting, it's busy, but there's also kind of moments of sort of drone time on autopilot. And, you know, you get with a crew and you you just you share what your interests are, you share what you're reading. And that was actually somewhere around 24,000 feet. <laughs> you know, when one of my navigator, I think he had just finished it and uh, he was saying good things about it and gave it to me. And I think that night I, I cracked it open and you know, went through it in a day or two and, uh, you know, actually ended up passing it on to another co-pilot a few days later and that I felt wouldn't get, you know, good use out of it as well. But that, that kind of close camaraderie, um, you know, really drove a lot of that, you know, kind of peer influence and in, in getting me into the real estate world to begin with. Yeah. That's always interesting, isn't it? How that book gets passed around so quickly to so many people, <laughs> And then it's it's also great to be around a lot of like-minded individuals, especially when you're starting off like that. I'm sure that it spurred quite a bit of conversation. Oh, a huge amount. And, you know, you, you meet people that are just researching, you know, that early stage and you meet people that have, you know, maybe bought, you know, one or two investment homes or have done, you know, passive investments. And then, you know, there's always one kind of granddaddy in the mix or, you know, grandmother who's, you know, really down in a whole bunch and they're the, you know, ultimately the, you know, the gold standard for, you know, going to when you have questions and, you know, we had someone like that in our pilot group and uh, yeah, it was really interesting. And, you know, a number of those guys specifically uh, left the aviation world as well to pursue real estate full time. Sure. So, you know, when you, when you got back and you started doing real estate investing, did you start where everybody else does with a single family home are you jumping into rental properties or did you jump right into the your niche, the industrial real estate? Yeah, I had the opportunity to right when I was getting ready to pull the trigger uh, on you know my first real estate investment, 
uh, to actually get to join a company. And it was, um, it was, it was started, it was a real estate investment focused. So really the equity investor arm of um, this company that the husband of a family friend had founded in the Bay Area. And he was looking for someone to kind of come on and help accelerate the operational piece. And I came on really to help on operations and eventually went on to be president of the company. And what we did with that prior company was we would partner with real estate brokers or developers, basically the hands-on component of a real estate investment project, people that had a really narrow, super focused expertise on a certain asset type. They were great at what they did, but maybe they lacked access to investor capital. So we would be effectively the equity funding arm. We would JV and kind of be co-managers through the you know, four or five years of that project and then exit together. And, and that was neat because I got to see a lot of different asset types, everything from multifamily to, you know, single family turnkey rentals, uh, office, retail. You know, we, we had a, one partner that even did, you know, ground up developments for senior assisted living. Uh, and then after that time, having done multiple projects with probably about eight or nine different operators, I really narrowed down in my personal favorite being industrial. And one of those partners was Mad Capital Partners, who I had the opportunity to join up full time with about three years ago. Sure. Well, let's dive into that a little bit. But before we do, um, head over to magcp.com, M A G C P.com for more information. Um, so let's def- take a minute and define what industrial real estate is, because I think most people on their radar is, you know, single family homes or even multifamily. That seems to be the aspirational piece of it. You know, people want to eventually get to commercial or multifamily properties. So can we define what you're talking about when we're dealing with industrial property? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, many people have never even stepped foot in an industrial building. Uh, It's quite common for folks to live, you know, their entire lives without actually being in an industrial warehouse. And so it's important to kind of know what the different types are. Um, So the the subcategory that we focus on largely is manufacturing. Uh, And that's going to be, you know, really, I think everything from assembly lines to production to, you know, the labor that goes into taking some level of either raw materials or, you know, intermediate parts and assembling them, creating them, machining, welding, turning, uh, you know, liquid injection, molding, whatever the, the product is, food production, whatever it may be, and have a either finished good or intermediate good that they go on to sell to the consumer or a, um, you know, next step uh, equipment manufacturer uh, who might assemble a bunch of different parts. And, and so that's the manufacturing side. Uh, then you also have warehouse industrial. And warehouse typically in its pure form is going to be shipping and receiving. You know, really a place not where things are made, but a place where things are moved and stored and ultimately part of this logistical network of getting things efficiently from point A to point B. And then the third type of industrial is what they call flex industrial. And that's going to actually be much more similar fundamentally to either multi-tenant retail, like a strip mall, or even a, a multi-tenant office building. And think long, um, you know, effectively long buildings with multiple segmented small warehouse space, usually smaller credit, you know, mom and pop type of, of tenants in there, lawn care companies, tire companies, you know, maybe independent machine shop or whatnot. Uh, those will be in that flex industrial space. And then ultimately the last one is going to be uh, specialty and specialty that can range the entire gamut. But, you know, one example that might be like a, you know, a biotech firm or, um, you know, some, some sort of a, you know, specialty building that needs, you know, cold storage rooms and, you know, particulate controlled air quality, all these special provisions for their manufacturing. That's going to require a much higher price per square foot real estate. Sure. So how does how does this work then? When you're you're talking about a lot of infrastructure there, are you essentially building or or buying the buildings and leasing to the to those companies, or and then how do you suit it out to meet their specific needs? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So that you know, there is the range of you know full ground up development or or lease up opportunities. Our niche as an investment firm, um, we buy almost exclusively through sale leaseback. So we are buying from owner occupants. So imagine a manufacturing firm. Let's say they're making some sort of car parts. They operate within that industrial building, and they also own the real estate. And what will happen is they will sell us the real estate and simultaneously turn around and sign a long-term triple net lease, typically 20 years in term. Uh, so operationally, nothing changes. They, they stay in the building, they keep operating, but on paper, they go from the owner to a tenant position and they can treat that transaction as a form of refinancing, as a, as a way to move capital. So they are effectively pulling the capital out of that you know, relatively illiquid asset and typically redeploying that capital into other parts of the business. They might be paying down, you know, a corporate line of credit that's due. They might be reinvesting in capital improvements, new manufacturing lines, you know, new square footage, whatever it might be that they feel they can use a use that funds, use those funds in a more efficient use. So they're essentially getting out of the property management business and focusing on what they do best. 100%. Yeah. And it tends to be quite often tied with either a merger or acquisition. Um, so imagine uh, imagine you you run this auto parts manufacturing company. You've grown it year over year. Uh, it's caught the eye of a larger private equity backer, and they make you an offer you can't refuse. They are going to buy your company and all its assets. Uh, and so that PE firm might take a mix of equity, and they will take on some acquisition debt to buy your company. And maybe they're laser focused on the operational component of your company, less interested in the real estate that that company owns. So what they might do is sell lease back that building. And now effectively, they've, they've trimmed down, they've reduced the total acquisition cost of that purchase and really narrowed it down just to the operational component, which they're most interested in. Sure. So, you know, you, you mentioned these, this lease back option. Uh, how do you find these companies to, in order to do this, or do they seek you out? Yeah, it's a combination. I'd say the most common is through broker networks. So the two founders at Mag Capital, a gentleman, Dax and Andrew, they're both commercial brokers by trade. And it's really, it's a kind of a, a very small subset of national level commercial real estate brokers that have the experience and expertise to execute a sale leaseback. It's a much more nuanced transaction because you're not only negotiating price of the building, but simultaneously you're negotiating the terms of the lease. And there's a lot of ebb and flow between those two you know, negotiations that are happening that are exactly tied with each other in order to hit an you know, outcome that you know makes sense for the both the seller and the buyer there. So that's that's one channel. And then the other channel is through actually um, private equity relationships. So sometimes you know, if we've done a sale lease back with a private equity firm, when they make their next acquisition, you know, they know we're an experienced, um, you know, an experienced partner for an SLB, uh, and they often will go to go to us again and say, "We just bought this new company. We're interested in sale lease back, and would you like, you know, basically first look at it?" So almost everything tends to be off market, just because of the nuance that goes on and the expertise required for that kind of transaction. Are you restricted at all by its location? You know, it's interesting, you know, compared to, I would say, multifamily or retail or even office, you know, asset classes that most investors have more exposure to, those are going to be demographics and location driven. So, you know, let's take an apartment building, a multifamily, say it's a hundred doors, you know, you're going to be intensely focused as an investor on, you know, the quality of your, of your earnings or excuse me, the quality of your renters of the, you know, quality of schools, uh, household income, you know, all these demographic location factors, how many cars drive by per day, how much visibility does my asset get? Because these are going to be crucial for hitting your occupancy and, and rent goals. Industrial is a little different. Industrial, we're coming in and we're buying a performing asset, right? It's already 100% occupancy. Um, typically, that that lease we put in place, long term lease, so we're not really worried about you know releasing events or, or renewals. Uh, it has built in rent bumps, so typically every year the rent will go up, you know, on average two to three percent. And so you have 
automatic rent increases, you have full occupancy. So it becomes much more of a defensive play. And in that case, much more important than the demographics and the location is the credit of your tenant. And that's really where where the primary risk is. So if that tenant credit stays strong, if they can remain viable to pay their their rent obligations, the deal goes perfect, right? And Mm -hmm. cash flows well, it's super dependable. And that's what we do a lot of homework and due diligence up front to ensure. So really that credit piece allows you, you can be a little secondary or even, you know, say 10 miles outside the edge of town, if it's coupled with the right strength of credit for your tenant there. Sure. So what, what type of thought is involved then regarding the market? You know, if, if that tenant goes out of business or, you know, has a, has a terrible situation there and you're stuck with this big industrial complex, what, what, what do you do with it at that point? Yeah. Great questions. You know, really a lot of it comes down to risk mitigation, So there's a lot of things that happen from point A to point B before you ever end up with an empty building that you have to release. Um, And and one of the major differences in an industrial lease compared to, say, a retail or or even a um, uh, you know a renter, you know, an apartment renter, is industrial leases typically require the tenant to submit quarterly financial statements. So because the outcome of that investment is so closely tied to the credit. We are entitled as landlords to see audited financials quarterly and and annual and get to see very closely the trends of what that company is doing. So we we have a full credit analysis team in-house, and that team will analyze the credit, and really they're looking for trends. And if for whatever reason, we started seeing some credit, um, a, a degrading credit situation, you know, that would allow us early on to start a conversation, to look at options. Do we want to sell this asset early? You know, if we start seeing this credit going downhill, you know, do we want to renegotiate the rent? Do we want to look at factors on, hey, how do we mitigate this decline? And how do we make sure that they continue to be able to pay their rent? Um, But let's say you go one step further, right? Uh, You know, all your analysis didn't quite, you know, do what it was supposed to. Let's say they, they go and file chapter 11. Uh, in many cases, these these companies, these um, tenant companies, are large enough. Most of them are, you know, do a hundred million dollars a year in revenue. So many will have multiple locations, and that's why the site level financial performance is so critical. And so we only buy what we call mission critical real estate. So typically, where the headquarters are, or where the the core manufacturing product is made. And we, we make sure they're profit centers. So even, even in that scenario, if a company says, hey, we're going under chapter 11, we need to really look at what parts of our company are making money, what's losing money. As long as you own the, the title to a, a piece of real estate that has you know, a profit center for that, that company, your lease is probably going to stay intact. Um, and so even if they shed some money losing areas, if you've done your homework up front, you know, hey, this this part of the company is critical to its future. Uh, and so that's one additional level of security. And l- let's say everything falls apart, the company, there's no way out, um, full in- insolvency. You know, hopefully you've, you've been able to see enough early on where you've been able to bring on a leasing agent, set up a, a releasing plan. And, you know, we, we only buy real estate in areas with really tight industrial vacancy. Uh, and it's typically between one half and one third of replacement value. So we, we buy real estate that really can't be replicated. You know, to, to bring on new inventory in the area is going to cost substantially more. So you end up with this really nice balance of, of just intrinsic demand on a limited amount of cheaper supply. And that, that cheaper supply is the type of building that we're buying such that we feel comfortable, even if all those other safeguards fell apart. You know, we'd be able to to release it at similar rates as our pro forma in, in our underwriting. Sure, you know, I, I we've we've spent twenty five minutes talking about this already, and and I know we've we've only scraped the 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 tip of the iceberg here. If people were interested in learning more or per, even participating, what are some of the things that uh, where would you direct them, and and what tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, with everything, education is key. Um, you know, I always recommend 
our investors to start with people you trust. Uh, talk to other investors in your network. Ask who's who's in, invested in, in industrial. It's a great starting point. Um, as far as education goes, there's some great resources. We have some on, on our website, magcp.com. And then, uh, you know, really, once you get through, you know, some general education, connect with a sponsor you like, whether it's us or someone else in the field, you know, talk through, um, look at their track record, see, see what they've done in the past, see how closely their, their exits have been to the projections. And, you know, ultimately, once you understand the model, if you like it, you know, start small, put a, a minimum investment in with a group, see if they, they do what they say they're going to, and then build a relationship from there. Right. No, that's, that's uh, some great tips there. You know, I, I really appreciate your time here today. This is this is a new topic, and and I I suspect we could spend an entire another episode going into <laughs> some of the weeds on some of this. Um, but before I let you go, uh, what is a question you wished I would have asked you here tonight? Oh man, uh, I would say you know a fun one is you know what's what's your most successful deal, or even you know what what deal gave you the most surprises? But um, you know, I I love. Now I'm going to ask you to tell you to tell us about both. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> we have the time. Say, all right. So a um, I'll, I'll well, should I start with the the positive one or the negative one? Let's 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 start. We'll end on a positive note. So let's talk okay. about the negative one. So the the one that gave us probably the biggest surprise was um, shocker. Right when COVID kicked off, and. Um, I, you know, I will say that we, we had a portfolio of about 22 properties going into COVID. 21 of them performed on time, were deemed essential manufacturing companies, were able to stay in operation, pay the rent on time. And actually, most of them ended up having a, a pretty good year in 2020. Um, the, the one exception we had was a, a single tenant health club, and they were, you know, unfortunately closed, forced to, to shut down. Luckily, they were in a, a pro-business state, Iowa, um, but they were shut down. They didn't know for how long. And they, they came to us and they said, look, you know, this is kind of unprecedented. Uh, you know, we're having this issue, um, you know, and we ultimately, we, we talked to them. We had been their landlord for a while. Uh, they were proactive about it. And they said, you know, we're looking for, you know, at least a, a 90, if not 180 day, effectively forbearance on paying rent. And it was it was really an interesting scenario because we didn't have to as landlords, but you know you really find yourself: Do I want to do the right thing in terms of this long term relationship? You know, this is a twenty year lease we have. You know, we mm -hmm. don't plan to own the building quite that long, but you know, even five years is a long time. And uh, you know, ultimately, we said, all right, you know, we'll start with with ninety days, and and right about at the end of the ninety days, um, I think a little longer. They, they were allowed to reopen, but they were even nervous about, hey, we don't know if we're going to be able to have the revenue to cover rent, but they made a, a you know, really a, a payment in good faith. And, you know, ultimately long-term, they kind of electively went back and made up some of the, those, or excuse me, made up all those missed payments kind of on their own. And it was, it was really, it was a, uh, it was a stressful situation going into it. Uh, but really they, they kind of showed that, you know, having this you know, positive relationship with your tenant, especially when it's a, a single tenant net lease type of, you know, investment relationship there that, you know, kind of trusting and, and doing the right thing for your tenants can often, you know, result in, in the, you know, a favorable outcome for both parties there. So, well, um, yeah, so yeah, it sounds I'm, like it turned into a positive in the end. It, it did. Yeah. And, you know, I think our, our investors, you know, they, they're probably going to get very close to what the original projections were. And, you know, everyone walked away, the business stayed viable and, uh, you know, all things considered, we were pretty happy with the outcome there. Uh, so, well, and then, tell us about your home run then. Yeah. So, and then sometimes you end up really just kind of choosing a, a good horse to back. Um, and one, one deal that we did that we exited full cycle on, they had recently been acquired by a private equity group. And this particular company made aerospace parts. And they simultaneous or shortly thereafter of being acquired, uh, the acquisition company, the private equity group wanted to sell a lease back. So we did. Uh, we bought this company and we loved where they were at. And we thought that they had a huge amount of potential growth ahead of them, especially with these new backers. And we were fortunate about two years in, I think they doubled or almost tripled their sales in the course of 24 months. Uh, so really, I mean, just a textbook 
private equity doing what they set out to do. And it was really neat to see this company grow from, you know, kind of a, a regional level company to a national, you know, they started selling a Boeing and, and Lockheed and all these national players. And they came to us and they said, we're out of room. Like we love this location. We're out of room. And luckily they had enough land. And so we were able to sit down at a table with these guys and say, Hey, let's figure out how we fix this problem. And we actually were able to turn this into a, a fairly substantial uh, development. Um, and so we we said, hey, we will actually be the, the GC on this development. We'll add a, a bunch of square footage, uh, a whole nother building extension for you to have this extra space you need. And the best part of that was because of the strength of tenant had increased so much, the bank suddenly felt much more secure, you know, than than how they looked, say, two years ago. And the bank was willing to um, lend 100% of that development cost. And normally developments have certain risk. Will it be leased at the end? You know, at what terms? In this scenario, we had effectively zero risk on that side because we had a pre-negotiated contract fully occupied from the moment it was complete. And they they took over immediately with a much higher price per square foot of rent. So we ended up with a much more valuable uh, property, and we we bought this thing at about four million, and I think sold it for a little over twelve. Um, so it was a huge, huge value add. There was no dilution for our, our equity group; it was all funded through through bank debt. And you know, ultimately, kind of a surprise home run, but it was one that you know ended up uh, just being fantastic from an investment side and great for the tenant because they were able to get the space they needed in a timely fashion. Mm. That makes me wonder, you know, like those people that uh, they go into this type of agreement, do you, have you had any of them like through acquisition or whatnot, eventually buy it back? Uh, only uh, only one and many have wanted to, uh, but, you know, the price increases and you know, we say, look, you know, it's, we're going to put it on the open market. Uh, but we have had one or two you know, savvy sellers that add a, a buyback option at a kind of pre-negotiated price. And on those, you know, we're usually crossing our fingers, hoping they don't execute that just because the industrial space has appreciated pretty nicely over the last couple of years. But, you know, in all those scenarios, effectively gave them the right to buy it back at a below market price. You know, we still made money uh, in a way that was, was predictable, but, um, you know, sometimes they will work that into the contract. Well, Neil, this has been a, an education. I really appreciate you being on the show. One last time, head over to magcapitalpartners.com. It's magcp.com for more information and how to connect. Uh, but really appreciate you taking the time, and it was a great conversation. Awesome, and thanks for having me on, JD. Had a lot of fun. <laughs>